So before I bore you to death with my little speech, I guess we should introduce our first guest, Gavin Burke from Future Audio Workshop. Hello. Hi. I think this is yours. My microphone. Yeah, hi. My name is Gavin Burke. I'm from a company called uh, Future Audio Workshop. And uh, we develop a synthesizer called Circle. And what I want to do is just kind of give you a quick idea about the science behind sound. Um, hopefully, it'll kind of give you an insight into the mechanics and what is actually happening when I'm talking into this microphone and these waves are traveling around the room and going into your ear and being converted into a sound in your brain. So the first thing I want to talk about is a wave. Now, what is a wave? A wave is a, dis is a disturbance that travels through a medium. Uh, as you can see on the screen there, we've got some guys jumping up and down. It's like a crowd wave. Uh, you can also have like a Mexican wave, or if you're having a queue and someone at the back of the wave, uh, back of the queue pushes, and the wave traverses through the medium, which is the people. Now, the people don't actually move anywhere. They just kind of move forward and then back again. So that's what a wave is. It's this movement forward and backwards. The actual person is not moving to the top of the queue. They're just moving forward, and the wave travels through them, the medium. So what is happening while I'm talking into this microphone? Now, if you can imagine that red line there is the paper in the speaker. What's happening is that that paper in the speaker is pushing back and forth at a certain rate. And it's pushing the air molecules forward, just like the people in the queue. They're being pushed forward, and that kind of signal is going through the medium and arriving into your ear. Um, first of all, the most simple type of wave is what we call a sine wave, and that motion is simply up and down. So if you're th to think about a sine wave as just back and forth, back and forth, it's just a very simple movement of back and forth. Uh, we measure this in frequency. So what frequency is how many times that goes back and forth in one second. If it goes back and forth once, we say it has a frequency of one hertz. Hertz is the measurement that we use for frequency. If it goes twice per second, then we say it's two hertz and vice versa. So is that also what I see when I work on a synthesizer? Exactly. That I exactly. can adjust and then the sound also changes in, in height or depth or... Exactly. Inside, inside something like Circle, what we're actually doing mathematically is just generating sine waves and what they're doing is they're going out to the sound card, out through the cable, into the speaker, and that paper then is pushing back and forth at a certain rate. And as you turn up the frequency knob on the synthesizer, it just goes faster and faster. And our brain then interprets that as a higher pitch. The faster it goes, the higher the pitch. Yeah. Yeah, so this is just more again. You can see here this circular motion. A sine wave is basically a circle. And what you can see here is that this circle is turning. And as it's turning, if you can imagine that that red line is attached to that bar, it's pulling it back and forth. And that's all that's happening. It's this circular motion, a sine wave. The piston and the steam engine, and the, I don't know if you ever see it in the films, the way they turn around, it's the exact same thing. It's back and forth, and it kind of turns the wheel of the, of the, uh, of the train. Yeah, so the wave travels through a medium. Uh, the pina, which is this outside part of your ear, kind of guides the, the tone into your ear. It passes then through the auditory canal, it then hits what's known as your eardrum, and it travels into this snail-like shape here called the cochlea. So I'm going to explain exactly what happens inside there because that's kind of where the, where the magic happens. Um, what happens is that the wave comes in and it pushes a liquid inside your ear. So it's almost like the opposite of the speaker. When the speaker paper goes forward, this here goes forward also, and it makes a wave that travels up through this snail-like shape and at different points in your ear, it will create a standing wave, which will be like a little peak. And inside your ear, depending on what point the wave actually stands, it will trigger hairs. And for each frequency, like middle A on the keyboard, there is a point in your ear that those hairs will be pressed, and you will start to hear a sound. Now, the science behind that is not fully understood, but basically you could kind of stretch out that if you wanted to and kind of stimulate the hairs at different points, and you could kind of play your eardrum like a keyboard. If you were to measure the distance between the two peaks in that wave that's traveling, so if you can imagine these waves traveling like that, and if you were to measure the distance between the two peaks, it would match up to a point inside this snail-like shape. So you can see here that each point around here corresponds to a tone. And you can see here like 200 hertz, that's if the wave is going uh, 2,000 times a second, then you have 3,000 times a second, and that's where those those tones are produced inside your ear. 
Uh, the interesting part about this is that we hear tone in kind of a, an unusual way. Uh, if something was spinning around at 220 times a second, we hear it as A, and then if we were to double that and make it spin at 440 times a second, we would hear it at A up an octave on the keyboard. So it's this kind of doubling all the time. And if we're at 440, then we doubled it again, it'd be like 880. So if you're, it's almost like do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. When you hit the do, the difference between the two do's is like 220 hertz and 440 hertz. So it's this kind of exponential or this logarithmic kind of way of hearing. It's not, it's not a, linear, a, linear, uh, a linear thing. So all you do is to hear a note up an octave, you just multiply it by two. So it's like do to do is just multiply it by two. So it's 440 multiplied by two is 880. And that kind of uh, doubling appears throughout nature. It's, it's, it's kind of, it's omnipresent everywhere. It's, it's in, in, in the length of your finger, like from this is doubled, doubled, seashells, weather patterns, even the way galaxies are formed. So you can kind of get an idea of how we have evolved into nature, and nature is all these rules that exist. And because we're part of it, we have evolved and our, our hearing and everything about us is kind of intertwined together. So basically every sound can then be uh, made by a combination of sine waves. So they're the most simple frequency, and by adding those simple frequencies up, we then can develop more complicated sounds. Like my voice is actually just all different sine waves added together in different amounts. You can create square waves like you have inside your synthesizers, saw waves, all just by adding up together sine waves. So everything is sine waves added together in different amounts, and you can create any sound. And that's basically what additive synthesis is. So if you ever hear about you know, additive synthesizers, that's all that's inside is a load of sine wave being produced and then at different volumes so you can create any sound, yeah. Uh, yeah, same with filters and EQs. All you're doing inside there is that you're reducing the volume of all these different sine waves that are making up the sound. If you look along here, you can see again like we have 500, 1K, 2K, 5K, 10K. So you can see that doubling again. Uh, which matches up to our ear. So it's this kind of uh, doubling that permeates throughout nature and it you know, throws itself up in our EQs and everything like that. And it's, it's, uh, it's kind of, it's interesting to know how that works so that you can um, then apply that to your music and know that everything is just sine waves and you're reducing the volume of sine waves when you EQ or filter or produce sounds. So recap, sound waves travel through the air, into your ear, there's hairs at different points are pressed to produce the tone inside your, inside your brain. You hear it as a sound. Every sound is basically just adding up sine waves together. And it's this simple back and forth motion and traveling through the air into your ear and triggering these hairs. Um, that exponentiality that you were talking about, um, that's also, that also occurs in nature. Could you say something about that when you said the finger and the shell? That was interesting. Well, it's, it's, yeah, it's, just, it's just logarithmic. It's, it's like this doubling. It just appears throughout nature. It's, it's, you could kind of think about it as an easy, yeah, it's probably too deep to get into, but this kind of linear stuff where you're just adding stuff up and then you have exponential, and it just means that you can represent more things in a shorter space. So you, we can have the full frequency range from, let's say, 60 hertz to 14 kilohertz, but you're in this length. If we're to do it linearly and each gap for each frequency was the same, then it could be from here to God knows where, yeah. So okay. it's just like nature is, 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 is being smart about the way, the way things are, yeah. And the same rules are applied. Exactly, like yeah. Okay. yeah. So um, what got you into this? Uh, I kind of originally, I was, I was always into music. I'm from Ireland and we have kind of a deep tradition of music. So as a kid, I would have been playing music and singing and all that kind of stuff. And uh, as I got older, my parents were like, you know, do engineering, get yourself into into a good job, as, as sometimes happens. So I wanted to always do something that applied music to my career. So I think this was the, probably the best way to do it, was to uh, kind of... just wanted to dig deep and know what you're hearing. You want to know how that works. Exactly, yeah. And yeah. you, I mean, it's not that you wake up in the morning and think about, okay, I have to build a synthesizer. Uh, maybe it is. <laughs> it is, okay. Yeah, well, when, when you're doing engineering and, you know, you're encountering these things all the time and you're always thinking about how do they apply to sound and the music I'm making at home in my spare time, that it, and as well, you start to inquire about these things. You know, if you have an inquisitive personality, you'd, you're always wondering, well, what exactly is going on there when I press a key on a keyboard and, mm -hmm. 
you know, when you're learning about it in, in college, then it kind of, it's the natural progression to work with something like that rather than moving into telecoms or something like that, which would probably not be that interesting to me. Okay, so yeah. maybe we should get into what, um, what your initial idea was and what came out of it. Yeah, so this is, this is um, Circle, our synthesizer. Yeah, it's a, it's a modular synthesizer, which means that um, we have all these different modules uh, that produce different sounds. Down here we have oscillators. Now they are the wave producing modules. So if you can imagine about what I was talking about, those waves, that's what's going on there. So if I, so if I press a key, that's producing these sine waves. You can select different types of waves. And you have wave tables, which are, are what I explained earlier, where we have these pre-created waves stored inside the, com inside the computer. Yeah. But it's mostly that you have to play one of them in order to know what it sounds like. I mean, when yeah. I look at this, I wouldn't know... Okay, What's going no, on? <laughs> I'm going to take this one who looks like uh, a dinosaur or something. And yeah. Then yeah, well, experimentation is also very important. You know, um, you don't have to know exactly what's going on with, with any music technology, you know. Remember the guys back in Detroit and Chicago when they got the 303, they just brought it home. They didn't know what it was and just started twiddling knobs. So, you know, it's, it's all about experimentation as well. You don't always have to know all about the science behind sound. Sometimes even knowing less about it can be helpful that you don't get too bogged down in it. Um, yeah, there's, there's so much software out there now and, and, and different, different products, you know, and, and options that my best advice to anyone would be to probably look at your tools at what you have at the moment and try and focus on them and not to be always, you know, following this, this kind of update cycle that's going on. If you're, if you're happy with your tools, you know, focus on them, spend the time with them, really get in depth and learn them and try not to be always looking over your shoulder at what's coming out from different places. So, so what is different with Circle compared to other synthesizers? Uh, well, what we really want to do is we want to start to go towards simplification. Um, I know Circle probably, if you're not familiar with synthesizers, it can look quite complex there. But relatively speaking, it's, it's quite easy to use. You know, it's, we're trying to make things visual, um, kind of get people to uh, experiment more by having everything on a single interface that you're not, you know, having to go into sub menus and, you know, really kind of complicated settings. It's just make it very kind of graphical that you just you know, grab something and move it around and attach it. And even if you don't fully understand what you're doing, you can see all your options there and you can start to just play about with the synthesizer and kind of create your own sounds. Um, that was the main thinking behind it. We're also developing um, kind of uh, applications for the iPad and, and the iPhone, which are also very visual and tactile. And, and I think that's the way we're trying to head is to move away from overly complex software and try and get back to something that's simple and easy to use but at the same time, something that you can kind of experiment with, that it's not so rigid in its, in its construction that you're forced in a certain direction. Yeah. So you can implement that in all the regular sequences like Ableton. Exactly. And, okay. Yeah. So that yeah. works that way. Maybe you can yeah. just show some of the sounds that you can do easily. I think by when you do it, then it's probably best to see what you're actually doing and what comes out of it. Yeah. So, yeah, you can just mess around, really. So that's the filter there. And... Uh, these things are called LFOs, which are low-frequency oscillators, which are little slow sine waves that you can attach to things. So you can see the little sine wave there moving. I'm going to connect that up to the filter. I can change the rate of it. kind of play around and you know try out different things and, and just get lost in it a bit for a while <laughs> so you have a uh, th basically the sine wave on the one side and then you have different filters that you can yeah, attach exactly. so it's it's pretty similar to the ableton technique as well yeah right? it's, it's so kind of the standard basically you have something on the left and then 
attach something um, to the sound exactly. on, on the right. Okay. Yeah. How long have you been around with this? Uh, this came out around 2008. Uh, we kind of started developing about 2007. Um, yeah, we're kind of doing this, and as I said, we're working on, on iOS applications as well, mm -hmm. so that's kind of, kind of our focus, yeah. Where do you think the future is heading um, with, um, with software synthesis? I think with everything um, around, I don't know, maybe 2000, you had the arrival of the PC at a point where that it could run these types of software. And what happened was that these companies were formed around that point, and they gradually evolved. And each time they evolved, their software got more and more complicated. And we're now at a point where if someone is starting out and they're looking at software, that it's just overwhelming. You know, if you open up different, different, I don't want to mention any specific software, but most software can be very, very complicated for the beginner. So I think what's happening is that we're now going to regress back to a point where we're not going to just hit people with loads of options. We're going to actually think about what we're actually trying to give them and make things that are easy to use. Because there's nothing worse than trying to start something and just being overwhelmed by, you know, software that is, is, is too, too evolved, it's over evolved I think at this point, it needs to kind of take a step back. So I think that's the future, is, is less about the technical aspects of it and more about you know, thinking about how can you express yourself through the software, so improvements in interface and, and all that kind of stuff I think is the future, yeah. But isn't that a kind of a movement back? I think when you were looking at analog synthesizers, they were always very simple. You exactly. had a, a few knobs that you were able to turn now it got more complicated and you got m lots more options with yeah. the software synthesizers. And now basically people are moving back again to make it more easy. Is that yeah. the way that you think that's, it's going? That's exactly it, yeah. yeah. Because I think what happened inside a lot of these companies is that you have a very small core of people who are close to the company and they suggest features. Let's say, I think the rule is normally about 10% of users are suggesting features. And those features are then being implemented in the software. But then you have this other 90% who are being kind of left behind because they're not using any of these features and those features are actually getting in the way of those 90% producing music. So what I want to do is I want to kind of think more about the 90% and maybe, you know, the 10% are already catered for. So that's kind of the angle we're going for is try and make music software easier to use and, and make it more accessible to more people. And I think that's quite interesting because you know, with mobile software and all this, you've so many people out there that now have mobiles and, and they're going to have tablet PCs and I think to be able to put technology into their hands and let them create music without all these other options in there, I think it could be quite interesting. It's almost like back in the day when, when the guys got those 303s and 909s and, you know, let's put as much of these simple software out there and just see what happens when, when it gets into people's hands. Yeah. Okay. Apart from the flexibility, which is... Uh uh, a big part of this virtual synthesizer you created. Um, what investments or improvements are you guys making to make this synth sound different from all the virtual synthesizers that are around already? Um, I think one of the main things is that once you're able to actually see everything on the screen at one time, you can actually have more ideas because um, you know when everything is buried in sub menus and, and kind of stuff like that you can't fully get a picture of everything that can happen at once so what we're trying to do is get everything on one pane have all your uh, modulations and all the different things there so you can actually just once you see them in front of you you can have new ideas you know I think that was one of the main things we we're trying to do I think sound wise um, it's very difficult to create something that sounds different now you know there's all these different new types of synthesis but sometimes they're just too abstract or are too weird for people, you know, it just, it, 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 they don't tend to be that musically pleasing or, or that we're used to listening to that classic analog sound from the 70s. It seems to be, you know, it seems to be just really what most people want. So I think we're more focusing on, on interface, I think, than trying to make something that sounds totally, totally different to everything else. Yeah. I wonder how, how, could, uh, how could some uh, virtual synths sound so different from each other, especially when you listen to a filter section? What, what's the magic? key some developers have to make it sound a little bit more fat. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's all really done. What we wanted to achieve with this was a kind of a rougher sound, you know? That was something that we were looking at. It seems to be quite popular within like the dubstep scene and uh, more kind of electro house. Uh, I know it was used by David Get on one of his one of his main hits. So, <laughs> you know, is that is that a good? I don't know if that's thing? a good goal. Yeah, <laughs> good promotion. Ah, yeah, but you know, it's, it's kind of for, for me personally. I remember we were in a car and myself and uh, the partner who uh, we designed it, and we were just sitting down, we we're listening to David Guetta as you do in the car, 
Uh, it was on the radio, of course, and uh, yeah, we're just saying to ourselves, that sounds a bit like Circle, and maybe two weeks later, we got a, an email from Sandy V, who's his producer, and he said, oh yeah, I got Circle, I love it. Um, I used it on one of my tracks, and it was a hit. Now, you might say, yeah, that's David Guetta, but at the same time, the way I look at it is that if there's, you know, two million kids out there, and they're listening to these electronic sounds, and they're getting kind of inspired by them to then go and make their own music, like, I don't know, I think all of us at one point were listening to something like Two Unlimited or something like that at some point. You know, no one's going to deny that. So Even if we wanted to or not. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. I think, I think I've gone past trying to be cool. <laughs> yeah, so it's, uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's just, I think that's interesting as well that electronic sounds are becoming more popular in, in mainstream um, American music. And I think sometimes people criticize it, but at the same time, I think if you think of all those kids who are listening to it and, you know, if just a small amount of those kids then want to take it further and get into the underground stuff and you know the stuff that we like. Then I think that's fantastic, you know. Yeah. Gavin is um, as so generous that he offered actually to give a free copy of um, Circle to everyone who submitted a tune tonight and whose tune will get played. I think that's that's very generous. Thanks a lot. So.